So I want to welcome you back to another lesson that we're offering for the children's anthology from the Charles Bruce, Bruce Foundation. Um, I've got myself on the screen right now, and I'll be disappearing off the screen so that you'll be able to see the slides as they're presented uh, later. But I'll be in the background talking to you and taking you through these different types of poetry. So we decided that since we don't get as many tutoring sessions as we might like, and not everybody can be at the tutoring sessions, that we would try to start creating some content video that you can look at and get lessons on writing and art so that you can prepare whatever it is that you wanna work on for the children's anthology. So what I'm going to be talking about today is different types of poetry so that if you decide that you would like to do some poetry for the children's anthology instead of writing stories or whatever, um, you will have that as an option. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to some of the different types of poetry um, so that you can decide which type of poem you may want to write for the anthology. All these different types of poems have different basic rules surrounding them. So when poets write poetry, they tend to follow specific rules depending on the type of poem that they're writing, and there are several different types of poetry. So we'll go through several of them, and then you can decide for yourself which one you think you would have the easiest time doing and which one uh, you might like to experiment with and make your own poems. So first of all, poetry itself is a way of representing language in a creative way that, that people can enjoy. Um, it's fairly simple. Um, it can go anywhere from a sonnet to a haiku to several other types of poems. All of the different types of poetry are meant to show your appreciation of language to others and the beauty of language and to express meaning of language in just a different way than you would if you were writing a story. So one of the types of uh, poem that we'll talk about is a ballad. Now, a ballad is a type of poem that has a song-like stanza. In fact, for a lot of times, it was written as a way to be sung, or it was written to be sung, and it had kind of a rhyme scheme and rhythm scheme that allowed it to kind of flow in that musical style. The ballad typically consists of stanzas that have four lines. So stanzas are like the equivalent of paragraphs in uh, poetic language. And those four lines follow a specific rhyme scheme. So when we talk about rhyme scheme, we're talking about the end rhyme of the poem, those last syllables or words um, that rhyme with each other. And the way that we do rhyme scheme is we start with the letter A, and then we go to the second line of the poem. And if it rhymes with the first line, that would also be an A. If it doesn't rhyme with first line of the poem, then it becomes a B. Then you go to the third line. If it rhymes with the first line, then it gets to be an A. If it rhymes with the second line, then it gets to be a B. If it doesn't rhyme with any of them, then it gets to be a C. So that's basically what we get with rhyme scheme. And the ballad follows a rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B in the four line stanzas that they have. So here's an example of just one stanza from Edgar Allan Poe's poem, Annabelle Lee. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. So this is the first stanza of that poem. And again, it follows in that stanza the rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, because the first line rhymes with the third line and the second line rhymes with the fourth line. Next, we have the ode, and an ode is a poem that's written in praise um, or celebration of a person, place, thing, idea, it can be any of those. Um, odes are typically written in kind of grand language, um, but their main purpose is to express admiration or reverence for the subject that they're covering. So it doesn't matter what the subject is, the ode is written in praise of that particular object. So again, I've got an example of an ode. This is um, only an excerpt of this ode, but it's Ode to the Book. And what you're going to get with this ode is you should be able to kind of 
get a feel for what the subject sounds like or what it tastes like or what it feels like or what it sounds like. It's a very involved poem with the senses. That's what you're really trying to push is those sense details onto the person who's reading your poem. So in this case, this is Pablo Neruda's Ode to the Book. When I close a book, I open life. I hear faltering cries among harbors, copper ingots, slide down sand pits to Takapia. Nighttime among the islands, our ocean throbs with fish, touches the feet, the thighs, the chalk ribs of my country. The whole of night clings to its shores by dawn. It wakes up singing as if it had excited a guitar. So no particular rhymes, rhyme scheme, no particular stanza length, anything like that, or line length or stanza length. Um, the main thing with the ode is there's an object or a thing or a person that is being praised in that ode. Now, here's one that you've probably been uh, involved with at some point in school. A lot of teachers, when they're trying to introduce their students to poems, introduce them to acrostic poems. And quite frequently, it will be an acrostic that's made with your name or something like that. So you take the first letters of your first or last name, and that becomes the first letter of each line of the uh, poem. Um, and we have an example right here of an acrostic poem. So if you read the letters going down, the first letters of each of these lines of the poem, they spell out the word poem. So the P in poem for pondering over words, the O in poem for our thoughts and feelings expressed, the E in poem for emotions run deep, the M in poem for moved by the beauty of expression. So each line of the poem starts with the next letter that is represented in the word poem. And we're going to talk about two different types of sonnets. And sonnets have become very famous and very well-used poems throughout history. The first poems date back, or the first sonnets date back to the 13th century in Italy. Um, the particular sonnet that we're talking about then is actually an Italian sonnet. And the Italian sonnet is the same as any sonnet in that it has 14 lines total in the poem. That's how many lines a sonnet will always have. So one of the clues as to whether you may have a sonnet or not is if you count all the lines of the poem and it comes to 14, good possibility you've got a sonnet. Now, the difference between the Italian sonnet and the other sonnet that we're going to be talking about is that the first stanza is going to be an octave, which means that you could count up to eight lines in that stanza. And then it's going to conclude with another stanza of six lines, a sestet. And so the total number of lines, eight plus six, equals 14. The rhyme scheme of the Italian sonnet is A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, E, C, D, E, which means the first, fourth, fifth, and eighth line all rhyme the second, third, sixth, and seventh line all rhyme, the ninth and twelfth line rhyme, the tenth and thirteenth line rhyme, and the eleventh and fourteenth line rhyme. So that is the characteristics of the Italian sonnet. And here's an, an example of an Italian sonnet. Um, another thing to note about the Italian sonnet, many of the Italian sonnets were written by Petrarch. Um, he was a famous Italian sonnet writer. And so it just kind of made sense that we would show you an example of a Petrarchan sonnet um, to represent the Italian sonnet. So it, again, if you look at the lines, you're going to see eight lines in the first stanza, six lines in the second stanza. Um, I won't repeat the rhyme scheme, but you should also be able to note that rhyme scheme if you go back and look at that. Or if you need to, um, there will be notes on uh, the website that will show you what the rules of these different poems should be. So 
Ways apt and new to sing of love I'd find. For sing from her hard heart full many a sigh. And re-ekindle in her frozen mind Desires a thousand passionate and high. Or her fair face would see each swift change pass. See her fond eyes at length where pity reigns. As one who sorrows when too late, alas, for his own error and another's pains, see the fresh roses edging the fair snow, move with her breath that ivory cried, which turns to marble him who sees it near, see all for which in this brief life below, myself I weary not but rather pride, that heaven for late times have kept me here. Now, I tried to also show one of the other um, key components of the sonnet in reading that. Now, I will claim that because this was written in the Italian language initially, the syllable counts are probably slightly off. It's hard to translate a poem from one language to another and maintain the correct syllable count. But in sonnets, it is typical to have 10 syllables per line in what's known as iambic pentameter, which means that there are five iams, which are a type of foot in poetry, and those iams are each two syllables. So if you count up five iams at two syllables each, that should give you about 10 syllables per line. Now, again, this poem may not have that represented as well because it was translated from Italian to English, but for the most part, that's what they're going to be looking to do. For something that hopefully will uh, make this a little bit easier to follow, we'll talk about the English sonnet. So again, it's a sonnet because it consists of 14 lines. But the English sonnet was popularized by William Shakespeare, um, that bard of Avon, who wrote several plays and several poems in his lifetime. Now, it is a sonnet, so it's got 14 lines, but its breakdown in stanzas and lines and rhyme scheme are different than the Italian sonnet. So with the English sonnet, we have three quatrains, so three stanzas with four lines each, and then it concludes with a couplet, a two-line stanza. Our rhyme scheme goes A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. So the first and third lines rhyme, the second and fourth lines rhyme, the fifth and seventh line rhymes, the sixth and eighth line rhymes, the ninth and eleventh line rhymes, the tenth and twelfth line rhyme, and the 13th and 14th line, being in that final stanza, that final couplet, they rhyme. So, again, the English sonnet was popularized by William Shakespeare, so it just kind of makes sense that I would share a William Shakespeare with you. And this is one of his more famous sonnets, sonnet number 18. And again, I'll try to read it in that iambic pentameter, the 10-syllable kind of thing, so that you can get an idea of what that sound is. Um, I can't guarantee that I'll be perfect at it, but hopefully you'll get some idea of what that's like. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines. And often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines. By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. Nor lose possession of that fair thou oust. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade. When in eternal lines to time thou growest, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, 
so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. So that's an example of the English sonnet. Next type of poem. Um, so we've talked about a lot of the rules in the poems, the end rhymes and the stanza lengths and all that. Free verse is a form of poetry that allows us to break all the rules. We don't have to worry about rhyme. We don't have to worry about um, the meter of the poem, how many syllables per line. We don't have to worry about how many lines in a stanza. We don't have to worry about any of the rules when it comes to free verse because a free verse poem just doesn't follow any of those things. It doesn't have a specific rhyme or meter. It doesn't have a particular structure. Um, as a matter of fact, when we get to the sample poem, you're going to see that some of the lines are even indented that wouldn't otherwise be indented because it just doesn't follow any of those rules. The thing with free verse is it's a poem that's still focusing on those ranges of uh, themes and emotions and expressing ideas in a powerful way um, in a simple form. So a really famous free ver verse writer um, was Allen Ginsberg. This is a very short poem of uh, Allen Ginsberg called From Sad Dust Glories. I think it was one of a collection of Sad Dust Glories. Um, it was the best title I could find for it anyway. So again, you're going to notice no rhyme, no stanza length requirements, no syllable count requirements. And again, if you look at some of the lines, they're indented differently than the other ones. So, teacher, bring me to heaven or leave me alone. Why make me work so hard when everything's spread around, open like forest poison oak, turned red, empty sleeping bags hanging from a dead branch. Okay, next type of poem um, that we're going to talk about is a limerick. Um, you've probably heard limericks. Um, limericks have very specific rhyme schemes. They have very specific syllable counts again. And they have a very sing-songy quality to them. So you can pretty much tell when you're hearing a limerick. And this is why. So it is a five-line poem. Every time it has five lines. The first line and the second line and the fifth line rhyme with each other, and they have eight or nine syllables, so their rhythm is consistently a little bit longer. And then the third and fourth line of the limerick rhyme with each other, but they have a slightly shorter line in that they have a five or six syllable count to them. So we don't know where the limerick originated, although there's a very good possibility that since there's a limerick in Ireland, that that was a place of origin for the limerick. So here's an example of a limerick. Um, I think this is a student example as well, which is kind of nice. It's called Star. There once was a wonderful star who thought she would go very far until she fell down and looked like a clown. She knew she would never go far. So again, rhyme scheme, the first and second and fifth line rhyme, um, and have slightly longer stanza lengths and the third and fourth line rhyme and have slightly shorter lengths. So that's going to uh, be where we'll end up with this particular lesson on poetry. There are other poems that we'll talk about in the future um, that you'll be able to practice. Um, I will have all of the notes for all the different types of poems um, put up on the website so that you have those. But for now, this gives you a good idea of several of the different types of poems that you can uh, work with. And once we get through all of the poems and all the lessons on the poems, I will also give you a little assignment that I used to give my students. Um, obviously, it will be completely voluntary. You don't have to do it. Um, obviously, it will not be graded the way that I would have with my students. But it will give you an opportunity to play with different types of poems and uh, see how you feel about writing poetry for the anthology. So for now, I'll say goodbye, and I look forward to uh, being with you in the next lesson.